because I know it's just God's got something for, for people in here that are just going through things. And this sermon is really about or for those people who have ever felt like they've gone through destruction or chaos or crisis and they wonder if God's really there. This sermon's really for somebody who's felt like they had a hope and they've been following Jesus and for some reason the hope's not coming true and for some reason the opposite's coming through and you've been praying and praying and praying and Jesus just isn't showing up. The sermon's really for somebody who's just like, you just feel like nothing you do. You're powerless to make any changes in your life. You can't get out of that debt. You can't break that addiction. You can't fix that thing with your wife. You just can't, you can't, you can't. And it seems like the great Savior is just not meeting your expectations. Is God already talking to somebody today? Because some of those are me in my Christian walk. Now, this sermon is not for you. If you are 100% sure of your faith and you've never doubted God in any of those situations. So I'm not talking to you. Go back to your Facebooks and just, you know, I'll give you some tweetable tweets to prove you're here. Okay, but for everyone else, this message is for you. It's, it's a Bible story that's so applicational, so relevant. We usually blow right by it because we don't know who these guys are, where this town is. And so we get on to the next part of the story, but it's so relevant to us because if you feel like maybe God hasn't come through on his promises for you, you're sitting in life a little disappointed with unmet expectations, this is for you. This is for us to go on a seven-mile walk with Jesus today. How many want to go on a seven-mile walk? We'll walk fast, I promise. Before we do, I want you to remember two phrases that are key don't miss the purpose, don't forget the promise. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't miss the purpose. Turn to the other neighbor that you forgot and say, don't forget the promise. Father, we just thank you for our time together and the message you've put together, Lord. I pray that I get out of the way and let your spirit speak. You've already been speaking through the song, through worship, through the environment here. And Lord, I just pray that what you have for your people will change lives. Not just be information, but transformation for us. We're in this room, not by coincidence, but because you've gathered us here together for your purpose, for your power, for your usefulness, Lord. We want to be attentive. Let our hearts be attentive. We want to be receptive. Let us receive what you have. We want to be transparent. Let us just open up to you. Lord, so we can be changed by you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just got, I was just praying, and I'm not, I'm not a nut job, I promise, but God just wanted me to tell you somebody's going to receive the Holy Spirit today. I'll explain what that means. So don't get all weird and leave or anything like that. But. Our passage today is Luke chapter 24, one of my favorites. Luke chapter 24, I say that just about every chapter, they're all great. But Luke 24, turn in your Bible. If you don't have one, you need one, raise your hand. We have Bibles for you. There's notes in your uh, programs, bulletins, and you can pull those out too. And this is an incredibly relevant Bible story. I love the Bible. It's so relevant. Don't think the Bible does not apply to your life. Jesus is going to show us today how every chapter applies to our life and points to him. So we love what we're going to get today. And I want to give you my first point if you're taking notes. I love you studious note takers. Don't miss the purpose of the Savior. In your Christian walk, don't miss the purpose of the Savior. I'm just going to walk you through this text verse by verse. There's so much rich application here. Chapter 24, verse 13. We've got these two disciples and they left the party a little early on Sunday morning, Easter morning, just hours after the resurrection. They were heading home to beat the rush, and they were a little frustrated and disappointed. Okay, verse 13 says, Now on that same day, the Easter day, resurrection day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, about a three-hour walk at that point. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Over the last few days, as they talked and debated these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. How about that? Now, don't, don't just jump to conclusions that Jesus kept them from recognizing him, although that would kind of be 
kind of funny of Jesus. We're going to think it's, we're going to see it's something else in a little bit. Verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? I love how Jesus, who's omniscient, which means he knows everything, he knows their hearts, he knows their thoughts, he knows what they're talking about, and he pops in, he goes, he could easily say, I know what you're talking about, I know all things, he says, hey guys, what are you talking about? What are you saying over there? They stood still, their faces downcast, they were upset. One of them named Cleopas, not one of the famous disciples, right? Cleopas, we can call him Cleo, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, as Easter morning, right after Jesus rose from the dead, we're talking just hours after he rose from the dead, and Cleopas and this friend are walking back to their old life, their old way of thinking, their old lifestyle. They're old because the party's over and we're frustrated and our Savior is, is on the cross. And they're, and they're walking backwards and we're wondering, well, who, who is this Cleo and this follower? That's how I think. I want to know who, they, who we're talking about here. And it doesn't necessarily say, but I want to give you a little information because I love teaching. In John 19, 25, we get a little indication of who this might be. It says, near the cross of Jesus, when he's hanging on the cross, were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. So Mary was the wife of Cleopas, and she was at the crucifixion. And later it says that she went with Mary Magdalene to embalm Jesus with spices that night before he was put in the tomb. So Mary was very much intertwined with the whole group of followers here, and, and, and even right up until putting Jesus in the tomb. I'd like to suggest that, that the other disciple besides Cleo was Mrs. Cleo, Mary. Not another dude, but Mary, his wife. And they were heading back home, man and wife, back to their homes, because, let's face it, her. Hopes and dreams are gone. Let's go home and beat the rush. How do I know what the clincher is? Because our passage says that as they were talking and debating these things, we never debate, right, Holly? It's always, it's it's just me and James walking. We're kind of like chewing on it. Let's just, hey, what do you think? What do you think? But, you know, there was tension here, so I'm just thinking that's a solidifier that it was Cleo and Mary heading home. So sorry, Daryl, who was playing the other disciple, you probably need a wig. It was Cleo and his wife. So the two are heading home to Emmaus, seven miles away, rough terrain. I've seen this road. I've been there with my older kids. I think I got a picture of it somewhere up here. And so uh, you look down in the rough terrain of this picture, and what you see is this main highway, but to the right of it, you see the actual road. Pretty rocky, pretty terrain, and a lot of places for bandits to hide. It was not easy terrain. It was, it was tricky, and so it wasn't a quick 7-mile 10K back to Emmaus. It probably took three or four hours, and it's like going through Graham Swamp and the Colorado Rockies at the same time, okay? So let's, let's meet, read on. They stood still, their faces downcast. They were depressed. They were upset. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Like, there's Jesus, of whom it all happened to, and he's looking right at him and saying, what are you, like, you, you, what are you, new? And, and if you and I were Jesus, it'd be like, we put him right in his place, like, dude, I'm right here. That was me. But he's just gracious, you know, and says, what are you, like, new? Are you a stranger? And Jesus goes, well, what things, he asked. He's so gracious with us and, and our stupidity sometimes, right? It says, well, about Jesus of Nazareth, he's talking right to him, he replied, and he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Notice he said, was a prophet. He's talking to the great I am, and he's now everything's was, the was story, the things in the past. He's already headed towards his old life. He's already left the things in the past of Jesus. He says, the chief priests and our rulers handed this Jesus over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third 
day since it all happened, since this all took place. I mean, the first day we still hope, second day, okay, we're kind of looking for, third day, okay, that's it, we're heading home. Third day since this took place, verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. This always reminds me of Holly. The women amazed, Holly amazed, so just, man, you always just quote this verse with your wives. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. At this point, there's glimpses, there's fingerprints, there's, but they had already grown in their despair so much that they just had to get moving on back to their old life. Three days. Three days we wept, three days we hoped, three days, no body, nothing. It's time to get back to life. It's time to just leave all these hopes and dreams in Jerusalem. We got to Emmaus to get back to. It was fun while it lasted. Miracles, people were getting fed, you know, blind man receiving a sight, you know, and, and we just got to get back because that was, that was then, this is now, this is our new life. Out of hope and despair, they were giving up. They were walking away. They missed something. So here was Cleo and Mrs. Cleo, depressed and sorrowful, and they were down and they're frustrated and they had expectations. They thought they knew Jesus. They thought they knew why Jesus came, right? They had hoped that he would redeem Israel, and they weren't just about their country. If, if Israel's redeemed back to a land of milk and honey, guess who it Guess who it profits? Them. If Israel gets redeemed, then Emmaus gets redeemed, my business gets redeemed, my family gets out of debt, my kids go to college, everything's starting to look good, and I can tell everybody just who Jesus is. And if now it's not going to happen. They thought they had it down. If we followed him, if we believed in him, then he would fix everything. We would have a great life. Believing in Jesus equals a great life. Have you ever, just in your heart, hoped that was the formula? Come on, would you just be honest? Like right now, you're just kind of hope that, you know, Jesus is so good, he wants me to have a great life. That's okay. It's who you are. It's, that's fine. But he did not meet their expectations, and therefore their hopes, their dreams, had been laying on a cross. And it created a crisis of faith. Have you ever been there where your hopes and dreams are still hanging on a cross? When the things you expected were dashed and being unmet by God? Have you ever thought, man, I thought if I came to faith, I enjoyed worship, I, I went to discover, and if I joined Engage, and then the things would go right in my life, and things aren't getting better, and, and I just thought maybe, okay, I'll just make sure I pray a little harder, and things would go better, and they didn't get better, and things are just falling apart around me, and, and have you ever felt that way? I'm going to assume that when we're unanimous and no hands, then we're all feeling that way, or felt that way, Okay. Cleo said, I had hoped, I had hoped, I had hoped, Jesus, I had hoped, I had hoped, say, I had hoped, I had hoped that he would bring me a spouse by now, I had hoped that he would make sure my car got fixed, I would hope that I had got out and out of debt, I had hoped that my marriage would be restored, I had hoped that, that I would be cured of this disease by now, I had hoped that he'd restore this life of mine, I had hoped that he'd get me out of addiction, I had hoped, I had hoped that this great defender of mine would keep the enemy away, but I keep getting attacked, I had hoped that the rescuer would somehow show up in my life, but he's nowhere to be found, I had hoped, I had dreams, I had Nothing. Welcome to the road to Emmaus. I had somebody email me uh, or comment a couple days ago on a, on a Facebook post, and I don't normally see the comments, but I was reading this one, and it said uh, something about, you know, staying strong in your faith. And they said, well, I'm not sure if you've ever really gone through anything that's shaken your faith. Uh, because for some reason you look at a pastor and his family and wife and you have to get this picture like, well, those are the protected, anointed ones, so nothing ever happens to them, you know, and so wouldn't it be nice to be that, but we ain't that, and so 
but I just got to tell you, it doesn't matter pastor or not, we get, we get attacked like anyone else. And it reminded me of a time when I was 29, where I just got out of bodybuilding, just married the most beautiful woman in the world, and I uh, had two kids, owned a business. I felt invincible. Have you ever felt invincible in your 20s? And then when you're 50s, you're like, what happened to that? And um, so it just felt invincible, but it felt like God had more for me. But I was busy, and I was strong, healthy, doing it all. And then one day when I was 29, contracted a rare syndrome called Guillain-Barre, which left me in about 10 days 80% paralyzed and 40 pounds less. Because, you know, if you don't move, if you don't lose it, use it, you'll lose it. I lost it. And so in the course of two weeks, I was 40 pounds down, fighting for my life, my wife driving an hour to see me every morning, back to run the business, take care of two kids, one of whom is Dakota, which kept her very busy. And, uh, and, <laughs> and, and so I had a moment in there that lasted a few weeks where I had felt like, God, what had happened? What, I, I thought I was doing everything right. I thought I was you know, doing this and doing ministry and doing business and, and leading my family. And I had thought, I had hoped, and I had hoped it wouldn't look like this. And I became, I, I got in a real crisis of belief. Like, are you even sure the last 10 years, I've been saved 10 years, even, even meant anything to you, God? Or maybe it doesn't mean anything at all. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it's just me. And something I made up. And I got to the point where I couldn't get out of bed. And if I could have shaken my hand or fist at God, I would have. But I was paralyzed. So I was kind of like, oh, Lord, you know. And, and it just came to a point where I felt like he might not even be real at all. Because so many people are praying and he just wasn't showing up. And everything I had hoped for and dreamt about and fought for and including him in on was somehow being crucified on a cross. There's pain in this journey, amen? We all know it. And so my road to Emmaus <laughs> in the hospital room was tight. It was tough. It was crisis. And there's pain in that journey, and, we, and there's not always answers, at least the answers that, that we want. But in the middle of that, um, there was a turning point where I was listening to the Bible on Walkman cassette tape, you know, the ones you had to fast forward and then flip it back to the, yeah, that's me. And um, I was listening to the Bible, and Jesus said, I, I've come to do my Father's work. I'm about my Father's work, and I must finish my Father's work. And it reminded me of the last 48 hours where I was screaming out at Jesus, and if you love me, you'll do the work my work in my body and get me healed so I could do this and this and this. And, and uh, I had a real awakening. Not that I wasn't important to Jesus, not that I didn't matter to Jesus, but there were much bigger things that I could be focusing on than me getting out of bed that day. Like maybe the people coming in my hospital room. And so what I learned through that and what stuck with me since then, because I've been through crisis, my family's been through stuff, is, is this, Jesus rose from the dead to finish his mission, not to meet all my expectations. Unmet expectations aren't always the fault of the person not meeting your expectations. We, in marriage counseling, that's one of the first things. I expected, and I had thought, and I had hoped, and usually, not always, but usually it's like maybe those just are the wrong expectations. Maybe they're self-serving expectations. And Cleo expected Jesus to be the Redeemer, but all of that expectation was towards him and towards earthly things. And you and I cannot be telling the Redeemer what he's supposed to be redeeming. That isn't letting him be our Savior, it's making him our servant here on earth. So here's what I've come to learn, and I want to give this to you. Earthly expectations of Jesus equals a life of disappointment. You'll, he'll never serve such small expectations when he's got bigger plans than include you and in what you're going through. Cleo thought, Israel, nation, but it really meant for him and his family and Jesus saying, world, creation, everything's bigger than you, what you're thinking. And so his plans are so much bigger. You and I have to set our expectations of Jesus in a heavenward direction. We've got to think about Jesus in a heavenly direction. Expect heavenly things. Okay, so what is the right expectation of Jesus? 
Here's why Jesus is so awesome in the story. He comes by Cleo and Mary, and they're down, and they're living in disappointment with, very, with the very one walking with them, and they don't know it's him, and they're, they get this skewed, unmet, unmet expectation of Jesus, and I believe that's, what keep, that's keeping them from seeing who Jesus is. They had hoped in this thing, and he's right there, but they wanted this, and he's right there with something even greater, and we start expecting things out of Jesus. We don't even recognize he's right here with us. And we think he's gone, but he's right here with us. I was screaming and yelling at Jesus in the hospital. A nurse kept coming in for about 48 hours and just consoling me. I couldn't move. I couldn't run. But she'd turn, and she'd just kind of console. And she'd say, listen, Mike, everything's going to be okay. Lifting my spirits until this happened. And I got this revelation. Of, and then I started getting better. And I went home. I started walking. I came back in with Dakota on my shoulders. Couldn't happen today. But on my shoulders, I went in there and said, I'm going to go tell that nurse, thank you so much. Because I didn't see Jesus, but you were Jesus to me. And I wanted to tell her and went to the, the, the superintending nurse. I want to find this girl, Jamie. She made all the difference. And she's like, what are you talking about? She was on and these dates, these times. I would know it. I was there and I saw her. She's got brown hair. And uh, she goes, we've never had anyone named Jamie on our staff. And my eyes were open. Sometimes we're yelling at a Jesus through our expectations of him when he's right there saying, I've got more. He has grace for us. Here, Jesus has been raised up for just a few hours, and he could be anywhere else. In your crisis, he could be anywhere else. He just rose from the dead. He could be taking care of important matters. Uh, he could be talking to the people that got resurrected on the day of the cross. He could be hanging with the famous disciples, Peter, James, and John, and those peeps. He could be anywhere else. And he says, no, those guys are good. He's decided there are a few disciples that are going to change the world. I need to get to them and walk with them. He spent seven miles with them, three hours with them. And here's what I want you to know. If you're down and you're disappointed in Jesus today, he's not hanging around super faith guys. He's right here in your life. He's right here in your life. He's walking with you even if you don't recognize him. He's working on you even if you're walking away from him. He's right there with you. Oh, you know, he's with Pastor Mike. He's with you because you're so precious and valuable. And if he can change your thinking and if he can fill you up, miracles will happen. Look what he says. He said to them, now he's gracious, but sometimes he's truthful. He said to them, how foolish you are. And sometimes we are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Messiah have to suffer these things? And then enter his glory, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures, how about that for Bible teaching, concerning us, concerning Cleo, concerning him. Jesus goes on this seven-mile walk, and he shows them how all things point to Jesus and his redeeming work. All things. He starts in Genesis. What's in Genesis? The creation of all things. Who did that? Jesus created all things. What happened in chapter 3? Sin enters the world in an onslaught war against people's souls. Don't think of Genesis 3 as, oh, you know, this really bad thing happened. You know, Adam slipped up like it was, uh, you know, an affair or something. But we, God's working through that. What you need to understand is that when sin entered in through this open door of allowance by Adam and Eve, the, the hell of fury of Satan rushed in to battle creation and your souls. I don't know if you've seen Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, but it's like on steroids. It's like darkness came into creation and unleashed its fury for souls and included all of creation in it and devastated it. We live in a wreckage of battle. And Jesus starts to walk him through Genesis 3. It says the woman will have a child and a seed, you know, and, and it will crush Satan's head. This is way bigger than me not getting a job. This is a huge thing. And he starts to go through the prophets, every single one of them showing how there will be a Messiah and he'll come in to restore how many things? All things. All things. The war is on to redeem all things. It's not a simple task. It's been going on for 2,000 years. It will culminate eventually, but there's no lazy, easy days in the life of Jesus redeeming all things. Paul says in Colossians, he says this, 
For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is the Son of God. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile, redeem to himself how many things? All things, whether on earth or in heaven, everything was affected by sin, by Satan. Making peace by the blood of his cross. The work started at the cross, and until he comes back, the redemptive war is on. Guess who's been enlisted to be a part of it? You and me. Everything created is supposed to point to his glory, and it's been devastated. We get to be partners with Jesus and turn in that ship around so that everything, our lives, everything we do, our work, our neighborhood, our world reflects his glory and points to him in praise. That's the great work we get to be a part of. And so if we have a bad day, and it's not that he diminishes or, or demeans your pain at all. He doesn't like your pain. He doesn't like Satan in your life. He doesn't like any of that. But here's what he promises. I can and I will work all of those things out to the good of those who love me and are called according to his purpose. He's got a purpose. He's got a purpose. It's to redeem all things. And if you're going through that, he knows it. But watch what he can do. Watch what he can do in your life. The story's not over in your pain, Cleo. The story is over when Jesus redeems your pain for his glory. He might do it early. He might do it late. But he's going to redeem the story for his glory to be useful for him. And there we can take joy knowing that he's a greater God than Satan. He's a more powerful God than Satan thinks he's powerful. He's got more going on in your life than you even realize. Listen, here's what you need to know. The purpose of the Savior is to redeem all things. Don't miss the purpose. Second point is this. Don't forget the purpose of the Savior. Verse 28 says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. Like, I got other stuff going on. See you guys later. And he knew he was beckoning them in to, to more, and they invited him in to have food and, because he knows they needed more, more than just the knowledge that there's, there's a purpose going on here of redemption because here's what we do as Christians. We get the knowledge, and we turn it into quips on coffee mugs and tattoos, and we think, this will hold us by. This is good, you know, Jesus is going to redeem all things. we got it going on. And then you need more than a coffee slogan when you get a report of cancer, when Satan enters your life and starts just unleashing fury on when you get attacked, when you go through things and you get bad reports, you need more than a coffee mug. Jesus knows we need more. So he says, after they urged him to come in, they said, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks. It's starting to seem familiar, or familiar to them. Broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And poof, he's gone. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. This is so huge for us even today. Jesus was just a regular dude, and they got some knowledge to that point, but once he broke bread with them, once he reminded them of what just happened four days earlier in the upper room where he promised them something, he was just an ordinary guy. Then all of a sudden they were reminded, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is Jesus. He did the same exact thing. And it's not just that, hey, they recognized him. They recognized something they forgot, the promise that he gave them. In John 15, he says, hey, don't fret that I'm leaving. If I don't leave, I can't give you the paraclete. I can't give you the comforter. I can't give you the powerful one to live the life that you're supposed to live. And so they dropped everything like they were missing the date or missing something. They just, hey, we're going to drop this, and we're going to get back there. And, and, and they knew what they were after. It says, the passage says in 44, they ran back. Jesus appears to them and says, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Cleo's like, yeah, you told us that. Come on, come on, come on. What are we getting at? Then he opened their minds so they could understand Scripture. Wouldn't that be awesome? He promised that for us, too. 
And then he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer, and he did, and rise from the dead on the third day, which is today, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning right here at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. And now, here's what he says. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Don't go back to Emmaus with knowledge. Don't go back to Emmaus thinking, you got this. Don't go back to Emmaus thinking, okay, we've got some good doctrine now. You need power from on high to live the life that God wants you to live. And what I'm afraid is most of the church has forgotten the promise of the power. We get away from it somehow and we get busy, we, get, we, we see some of it and then we get our own skills and we read the right books and we say the right things and all of a sudden we realize we've forgotten something. We've forgotten the power that we need. Some theology correction here. I want to make sure you all understand. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's a promise. He comes into you and you have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's the problem. We leak the power of the Holy Spirit. We get on our own. We get just moving along. We have an easy season and it just leaks out, and it's okay because we feel like we're okay, we're doing good, and then something gets unleashed on us, and we realize we are powerless to move forward, powerless in our prayer, powerless to pray over others. And so something happens in our life when we realize, what are we doing? We can't do anything else. But these disciples, they knew what they needed to do. And they went into the upper room, and you know what happened? The Holy Spirit came down and filled them. They spoke in tongues. They healed the sick. The sick, they prayed over people. They they, uh, cast out demons, and they preached the gospel, and people got saved. They received the power of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Savior is power from on high, power from heaven, power of the Holy Spirit. And a powerful life should be a supernatural life. Unfortunately, we don't hear much of the supernatural or we don't trust it. Can I get an amen? We hear a powerful report of what the Spirit's doing and we either think, well, that's not me, or we think, that guy's a kook. Because why do we think that? Because we don't see enough of it. And why don't we see enough of it? Because, quite frankly, we're not living by the power of it. We may have leaked. And we need a refilling. You don't lose the presence when you leak the power. We have cell phones. It's still my cell phone. But if it's currently dead, what do I need to do? I need to fill it back up. And Paul tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Don't live your life without the filling of the Spirit. Don't live your life without the power of the Spirit. Why? Because you're a sitting duck. You're a target for Satan. You can't go by knowledge and quips and even doctrine. You've got to have the power of the Spirit living in your life to be, make you an overcomer over those things and be a part of his redemption story in people around you. We've seen that here at Life Coast Church. We've seen a power of prayer over people. We've seen as Jesus promised, he'll give you wisdom and words. I've seen my wife just give words to people that I knew she didn't have any clue what was, she was saying and it just meant something. They broke out crying. I've seen Pastor Jeff just praying over people and demons are leaving them. I've seen, don't get scared, it's okay. I've seen people just, you know, go wretched marriages and all of a sudden with power of prayer and they're coming back together miraculously. I've right here prayed healing prayers over people and a hammer gets healed and a goondy got healed of a hurt shoulder that was nothing was taking care of it. We have seen this at Life Coast Church. I have seen us bid on land and offer prices that are really peanuts on the dollar for a land value, and God says, here you go. That is nothing we've done. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when the power comes upon us. That's what happens. Things happen that you just can't explain with reason. In a supernatural life, you should have things happen. I don't know how to tell you what happened. I just know the Holy Spirit's involved. And I'm able to just say exactly what the disciples did, and here's why the gospel of Jesus Christ afforded that on the cross so that you can live a transformed, renewed life in him. Would you like to receive Christ? 
Because all the miracles, hear me on this, all the miracles are supposed to be used to confirm the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Not become a spectacle to confirm the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's why we need the power of the Spirit. Overcome the chaos, overcome the crisis, and deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ with confirmation power that he is here. We should hunger for the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says this, I want to know Christ I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him and sharing in his death less of me, more of Jesus, so that one way or another I can experience a resurrection from the dead. I want to live a resurrected life. You know, Paul was in jail at this time. Three years' time, he was in jail. He should be saying, woe is me. I'm so sad. Jesus, you didn't meet my expectations. Jesus, my hopes and dreams. And you know what he did? He remembers Jesus telling him, in your weakness, I'll be made strong. Hang out. Chill out, Paul. I'm doing a bigger work. Okay, he says. And later on in Timothy, he says, at this point, I'm still in jail, but almost the whole palace guard has received Jesus Christ. And not long after that, the the entire Roman mega empire had lost its power to the power of Jesus Christ. We've been enlisted in this redemption work, an all-out war and battle for souls and creation. There's bigger things in our lives going on, and Jesus doesn't say, your life isn't important. He says, it's a part of it. I've redeemed you for a purpose, my purpose. I've redeemed you in your crisis for a greater purpose. Would it be okay? Would it be okay if we just walked along the Emmaus Road a little bit in your crisis so I can show you bigger things? Would it be okay when I show you those bigger things that you realize you need the power and you just drop everything and run back and get more of the power of the Holy Spirit? Can we do that, people? Can we understand that where we're living right now really isn't where Christ wants us to live. And I'm not saying your actions, I'm not saying your behavior, I'm saying your faith and what his power can do through you in that world out there. Even in your trial, and we face them all the time, there's more at stake. There's more at stake. And he weeps when you weep, and he cries when you cry, but he bids you to let him open your eyes something bigger, a bigger purpose, a greater power to live by. And that's why he rose from the dead. Not to meet all our expectations. We don't want to be a, live a disappointed life. But to use us and partner with us to redeem all things for his glory. And eternity in heaven to boot. I'm going to ask you guys just to stand up for one moment. This would be really easy to say, okay, amen, go home and check, check this out. Just wait one minute. Go home and get in your prayer closet or whatever that is, you know, where that is, by your pool, you know, sitting out by the sun and praying today. And It'd be easy to say, go get you some Holy Spirit. But I want to just tell you one thing. He didn't say, go back home, Cleo, and pray for the Holy Spirit. What did he say? Stay and wait. And they're all plural. You all. Jesus said, all y'all, wait together. Why would he say that? Because if we get alone, we start doubting. We start reasoning. We start getting unmet expectations. But when you're all together, and your hearts are together, you hunger together, something different happens. And they went to the upper room. And I know if you're like me, you're thinking the upper room's like this little widow's apartment that Mary had upstairs. They're all crammed in there. I've been there. I got a picture for you. A picture of the upper room. That's where the entrance is. Looks like it might be cramped. But look at this. It's huge. You know how many it fit? Over 500 people. You know how many people Jesus appeared to after the resurrection? Over 500 people. How many went together to the upper room who hungered and prayed for a filling of the Holy Spirit? Over 500 people. And did it happen? It happened. And they came down on them. I'm going to give you a chance today to think, I could go home and just pray like crazy and hope it happens, or I could stay right here. It's okay. Just wait a little bit longer. Just stay right here together and, and pray together and 
and pray that God will do something while we're all together as a body because because God's called us as a body to change this community as a body, not alone. And so might it be okay if we receive the Spirit as the body and do this all together. And so that just, just, I know you might have dinner cooking. Maybe you got a cell phone going off or notifications from Instagram. Just put it in your pocket. Kids are going to be okay. I've already told them. We're going to buy them ice cream. Everything's good. <laughs> Everything's good. Because Jesus said, wait. It's almost like he knew us Americans. Wait. Er, slow down. I'm doing something in some, someone's heart today, and I need you to wait. If not for you, for them, just wait. If you've got some unmet expectations about Jesus and you're disappointed, maybe even this morning you're mad at him. Maybe if you feel like your hopes and dreams are dashed and they're hanging on a cross and there's really no redemption of them and you don't know how you can go back to faith. You don't even know how you made it in here. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've had some real crisis of faith and you're wondering if you're going to hold it all together. You're wondering if you can lead your family. You're wondering how you're going to make it through. And if Jesus would just had met your expectations, but he's not, maybe, maybe you're disappointed. Would you be transparent? Just raise your hand if that's you today. You're going through a crisis. You're going through a crisis of belief. Like, I just wish. Why can't? It's okay. He's on the road with you. He's not looking down on you. He's walking with you. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, I just want to pray for these people right here. That you are so gracious and so good that you walked with Cleo and Mary and you just graciously opened their eyes to something bigger. You gave them grace and peace and salve for their crisis, but opened their eyes so they could understand this is bigger than them. And you've still got the story in your hands. You've still got the crisis in your hands but it's useful in your hands. And Lord, I pray that the people here that are struggling right now would give their issue, their crisis, their struggle into your hands so it could be used for something greater. Give them the faith they need to stay strong, to overcome. Lord, just rest your spirit upon them right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask everyone else, and maybe all of you, If you feel like you've been powerless in your life and you got through a few crises, but you feel like there's, your life is nothing like, nothing like the disciples. Your life is nothing like some of these people that are saying there's miracles. If you feel like you're not getting through things, you don't have the strength, the power, you can't even think about telling your neighbor about Jesus because you just don't have what it takes to do that or the knowledge or whatever else. If you're sitting here today saying, I'm hearing you, Pastor Mike, about the power of the Holy Spirit, but right now I think I leaked out. I'm going to ask you during this song, we're going to just sing a chorus for a couple minutes, just like they did in the upper room, all together to come down and invite him into your heart. Jesus is there, the Holy Spirit's presence is there, but you need the power to fill you before you go back out there. I'm not saying it can't ever happen at home. I'm just saying right now, wait, be still. You're all together. We're going to pray for each other, and we know that we need it. Amen? Even pastors need the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to sing. And if you want for us to pray over you and pray over each other to receive the power of the Spirit for your life, just slip out and come down. Just slip out and come down together as a body and watch what God might do through us. Father, I just pray that we're receptive to what you're asking. I pray we're receptive.